touch on oils a little bit. Um, 2.5 weight, 5 weight, what, what's the difference, why, uh, and, and, and what, what do you recommend? I mean, look, in the old days, we used to make forks not really with shims, you know, they used a lot of holes and, and bleeds, and there, the oil, what we call viscosity, the thickness of the oil, played a major importance to, to what you feel and the damping. But today, with modern suspension, you're using shims, and basically what we want to use is the thinnest oil possible with the lowest friction as possible, and, and we want to control the damping through the shims. And uh, we've gone away from using different viscosities. I mean, you know, most of the time on a fork, you'd use a five-weight oil. I'd always recommend a five-weight oil with all modern suspension today. And uh, that's basically universally the case now. I mean, if you've got a, a fork with shims, you use five-weight. And on a shock, we even go thinner oil. We use 2.5-weight because there the friction properties aren't as, as important as the heat properties because a shock gets very hot and the oil tends to get even thinner when it gets hot. So, yeah, you want to use as thin oil as possible, but with good lubrication properties. And a shock, we even go thinner than the fork, because it's easier to make a thin oil with not so good lubrication properties, but better heat properties. And in yeah. a shock, we use a 2.5 weight of oil. What is an air gap, and, and how does it work? What does it do? Why is it there? Look, I mean, look, it's quite a long story, but if you look on a shock, you have what we call a progressive linkage. And on a KTM, you have a progressive shock. Uh, internally, we build a system which creates, on a graph, a progressive curve. And what happens within a fork is as the fork compresses, the air gap compresses, and that is what creates the progressivity of a fork. So the more you play with the air gap, the more you can create a more progressive or more linear action on the fork. So by reducing the amount of oil, increasing the air gap, you have a more linear um, curve on the fork, but generally speaking, we, we try to keep to a pretty standard air gap, and rather work with the shims to create that. And yeah, sure, you can get away with small changes in oil to suit personal preferences, but generally speaking, you should stick to a recommended what's in your manual if you're going to service your own fork. Another thing uh, is uh, these air cells that that people have started putting on their bikes that I hear are wonderful things that you know improve your comfort riding style whatever i mean what do you think of that look i mean we went through the, the what the air chamber is for and, and removing oil from the fork and basically it's exactly the same principle you know air cell just allows you to have a bigger air chamber which in turn creates a less progressive fork action so you might end up using more fork stroke but if your fork is set up right with the right air chamber i don't believe you, you're going to need air cells and you know, the amount of testing we did over there with them, we never really got a, a very good result. You know, we could achieve the same effect by taking oil out the fork. So, you know, when I think they were useful is if a guy took a motocross bike and wanted to use it for enduro, and he put on air cells without doing any, any internal valving, he made a much more linear fork progression and the fork worked better for enduro. But that just means the thing wasn't valved right and you know you should rather spend the money i would say then on, on getting it valved right and using the right quantity of oil in the fork to achieve the same if not a better result you know yeah yeah i mean this thing about personal setup i think the most important thing is like i say to make sure you got the right spring rate and then make sure that everything on the bike is right you know you check the sag check i would start off always with the fork clickers in a standard position as recommended in your manual, and that is a, is a good starting point. And in terms of a personal setup, you know, for, for a technician like myself to, to say, you know, okay, I'm going to put more compression clicks and there you go, you got your personal setup, that, that's bullshit, you know. I, I prefer to leave a fork with a standard click and make it so I know that that bike is working exactly how it should be. And that'll be better than, than a personal setup. The only way really to do a personal setup would be to go out testing with a rider. And you know, you've got to go spend two or three days out there with the guy, changing settings, and you probably find 90% of the time, if you put him on a standard setup with the right springs, it's going to be pretty much as close as possible to the best setup for him, other than spending three days at the track with him. And you might find that after three days at the track, you're not even that far off from the standard setting. We spend months testing those bikes to get it where it is. And if everything's right, the engine mounts are tight, the tires are in good condition, the pressures on the tires are right, the handlebars in the right position, 
you know, all the dynamics of the bike are right, the clickers are on standard and the suspension has been serviced, he's going to have an excellent setup. I mean, I don't, if you're going to put on a different handlebar, make sure it's similar to the one you took off. If you're going to use, I mean, to me also, the enemy of suspension are these extra double thick tubes. You know, I mean, I really, if you put in, say, the thickest, heaviest tube full of the slime and I mean, you're not going to have a good suspension, I'm sorry, you know, that's, you can't add so much weight to the wheels and expect Guilty the suspension <laughs> to, yeah, I mean, you know, there's so many small details that, that, like I say in the beginning, add up, you know, I mean, on a shock you have a swing arm with massive amounts of leverage, so, you know, you overcome a lot of friction issues through the swing arm, so if you have a little bit of a sticky shock, it's not the end of the world, but whereas on a fork, any amount of friction whatsoever is completely ruining the fork action. So, I mean, on a fork, it's vital to keep that thing fresh. I mean, it's, it's what we call the sort of break-free action. You know, if that fork can't start to move, then, yeah, then the fork is never going to function properly. Once the fork slides and starts moving, okay, then, then normally it's okay. You know, once it's in motion, it, it's not too serious. But that initial break-free movement of a fork is vital for a good fork action and that's where oil changes and bush changes are, are critical. Often if you look at a fork bush for example, people take them out, they look perfect and they put them straight back in but 90% of the time, you know, if you understand suspension you can really see that that's, that's affecting the fork and, and it, yeah, again, you know, you can change damping as much as you want but if that fork isn't moving freely and isn't serviced regularly then, you know, you're kidding yourself about, about changing settings and stuff. At the end of the day, if you don't go through everything with a fine tooth comb, you don't clean every component, you don't change the friction surfaces and check them, yeah, you're never going to get to the same results. You know? you, you the other thing I wanted to talk about is the story with these push button uh, fork bleeders and whether or not it's necessary to have them um, or whether it's just, uh, it's just a waste of time. I mean, I, I don't, I don't say they're a waste of time. I mean, it is quite important to bleed the air out your fork, and, and generally speaking, forks shouldn't really pump up with air. But you get forks that do. Usually, a fork that's that's getting a lot of air internally is because of bad tolerances or worn bushes. That maybe from the factory there's there's a bad tube or something. But altitude changes obviously also affect that. I mean, the only thing with the bleeders is, I mean, you have to push them when the wheel is off the ground. I mean, when the mm. bike's on a center stand and the fork is fully extended. And I think a lot of people push them while they're riding and push them when the bike's loaded on the trailer. Mm. And there, they, then they, they actually a curse, you know. But generally speaking, if used properly, I don't think they, they're bad. But I mean, I personally, riding enduro, I don't like them for the fact that if you break one off with a branch or something, which can happen easy because they've got a tiny, thin little base, you know, then you bug it, you, you're sitting out there with oil squirting out your fork and that's not so beneficial and a lot of the times the really cheap ones are actually leaking air, which I find and that, that's also a no-no. Hmm. So I mean, I agree with equalizing the pressure within your fork, I mean, I, I, that's obviously something we should do from time to time, but generally speaking, forks shouldn't blow up with air. I mean, if you go down to the coast from Joburg, I would bleed my forks before I go ride at the beginning of the ride, but I mean, apart from that, it's yeah. very seldom that you need to bleed the folks, you know? Yeah.